Welcome to Christ Church Online. We are so excited that you're able to join us today. And if you are ever, ever in the Northern New Jersey area, we would love to have you join us live in worship, whether it's at our beautiful cathedral in the heart of Montclair, or if it's right here, right here at our 107 acre campus in Rockaway Township, it would be our honor to have you join us. We broadcast every Sunday, so please subscribe to our YouTube live stream, or you can follow us on our social media platforms at Christ Church USA, or you can also visit our website at ChristChurchUSA.org where we connect people to God and people to people. Come on, let's go check out what's happening in the sanctuary. Who would buy that the highest king would wear? I was lost, but he brought me in. Know oh, his love for me. Oh, his love for me. Who oh, the sun sets free. Oh, it's free. No shadow you won't light up Mountain 
mountain you won't climb up coming after me There's no wall you won't kick down Lie you won't tear down coming after me There's no shadow you won't light up Mountain you won't climb up coming after me There's no wall you won't kick down Lie you won't tear down Let's declare it in the sanctuary There's no shadow you won't light up Mountain you won't climb up There's no wall, there's no wall There's no shadow There's no wall, there's no wall One more time, say CC online and we will get you back to your worship experience in just a moment but we want to take time to say thank you for your generosity and helping serve the people in the northern New Jersey area and it's because of you that we are able to have an experience like this online if it is on your heart to give to our ministry please text the word give plus the amount to the number below or hit the give tab on the top corner on our website and now back to our message my topic is God in the workplace. If you have your Bibles, join me in Matthew chapter 25. And what we're going to learn today is the fact that God is intimately involved in our work lives. Jesus spoke right to that. And for most of us, the people that we work with, they're often our closest friends. And our worst foes. In fact, uh, I love what the Huffington Post uh, on earth through their survey finding, they said if the average person lives until 80 years of age, they actually spend 26 years sleeping and seven years trying to sleep. 
and 13 years working. When you tally up all the years, all the hours into years, 13 years working, and one year for overtime. In other words, your work life is a significant part of your life. Let's join Jesus as he's teaching us on the parables, parable of the talents. Verse 14. Again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. We have the verse on the screen as well for you who may not have brought your Bible. Verse 15. To one he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, and to another one bag, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and gained five bags more. So also the one with two bags of gold gained two more. But the man who had received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. Stop there. This parable, it's almost like three distinct scenes of a story all integrated. And so I want to look at it that very way to see what was Jesus saying to us? What are the things, the kernel of truth that just, it just floats up to the top of the scene so I can get it and I digest it and understand it so I can see how God's intimately involved in the workplace. Scene one, think like an employer. The scripture describes to us a master, a landowner, Wealthy. Jesus was making a correlation with that landowner and God. In essence, saying God's just like this guy who went on a distant journey. And you, me, were just like one of those three servants. And so the employer or the master, he wanted to increase his assets and his net worth. He made a bold move by calling to himself three of his most trusted employees that he'd been watching, eyeing, checking out how they work. And he gave them a large sum of money, each of them a different amount of money based on their ability. That means he'd been observing them, checking them out to see what they can manage, what they can handle. And so he didn't make this decision carelessly or loosely. In fact, for us to understand what the master was doing and what it means to think like an employer, I want you to understand in the ancient world, because we see the word servant there. In the ancient world, please don't ascribe modern definition of slavery and servanthood to first century definition. We, it's totally different. In the ancient world, there are five levels of stratification of slaves or servants. It was very much a part of the whole social system and economic system in ancient world. The highest level was a servant that was almost like a business partner to his master. Such was the case with these three. The lowest level is a galley slave, someone who rowed in the bottom of the hull of a ship and they're chained to the ship and they're rowing all day. These five or these three servants, the master said, one I'm given five bags of gold. Some translations say five talents of gold. A talent was actually a weight. It ascribed specific a number. The talent was anywhere from 55 to 80 pounds of that particular element. I checked out the stock market on Friday and the weight of gold, or they say the value of gold on the stock market today, it's about $1,200 per ounce. So if I go through the math and say, and I'm going to take the highest amount of weight, 80 pounds, and multiply it by the number of ounces that that represents, that servant that received one bag of gold, it was actually equivalent to $1,536,000. That's a whole lot of money. The servant with the two talents of gold received $3 million. The guy with the five bags of gold, he received $7.68 million. And then the master in essence saying, hey, look, I'm giving you $7.68 million. I'm giving you $3 million. I'm giving you $1.5 million. I've chosen to give that to you based on your ability, your gifting, your financial prowess, and I'm going on a journey. The Bible is silent as to where he went. The Bible is silent as to how long he went. 
But what we do understand is this. If we're going to think like an employer, it means we have to exhibit the same level of care for the management of our role. If you want to be able to thrive in the business part of your life, you have to see yourself exhibiting the same level of care for the job that you have been entrusted with, just as if you were the owner of that firm or the CEO or the founder. Now, my wife and I, we're the founding pastors of Christ Church, East and, and, and East Campus, West Campus, and there's certain things that just we have inside of us that are so natural that we look to see happen in our staff and in our volunteer team and in our broader congregation. We have some 2,000 people that volunteer, and we have some 60 full-time staff and some 500 leaders, and, and so a congregation of some 9,000 people. And so what we look to see is that, do they have the same heart, care for the work? When I'm walking and I see paper on the floor, I don't pass it by. I pick it up. I throw it where it belongs. Because in my mind... I was here when there was nothing. Think about your home. When you're walking to the kitchen from the living room and you see maybe a clump of dust. If you're a parent, you pick it up and you have to teach your children how to have the same care for your home as you do. And so what this employer, the master, was looking for is to see if these employees exuded the same care as he. See, employers entrust employees with their customers, with their company funds, with their business product, with the management of other employees, with the opportunities of growth, and the company's reputation. See, you must first choose to act like an employer. Don't worry about the label, the title. Don't worry about the description as to what you were brought on staff or brought into that business to do. You have to embody what it means to have a value that says, I'm owning this responsibility that's been entrusted to me. That's what Jesus was looking for. He said, one guy, five bags of gold. Another guy, two bags of gold, $3 million. Third guy, $1.5 million. And he wanted to see who had care for what has been given to them. you got to learn this thing to have the right attitude, right actions about what's been entrusted to you. Growing up, my mother always tried to instill this type of perspective about what I do, whether my homework or whether chores around the house. And she always used to say this to me, and I thought it was her own thoughts. I said, wow, that's so astute. I thought Sylvia Ireland came up with this. She used to say to me what St. Jerome said, good, better, best. Never let it rest till your good is better and your better is best. So she said to me, David, good, better, best. Never let it rest till your good is better and your better is best. And so I thought when I looked up this quote, I thought I'd see Sylvia Ireland. It was, she, was, she was plagiarizing. But it, the, 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 the quote, though, it still resonated deep within me because what it was showing me is to how to think like someone who owned what they do. Have you ever watched the program Undercover Boss? Very interesting show. The owner or founder of a company, whether 7-Eleven or Cinnabon, they put on a disguise, whether change their hair, change their facial look by, you know, by some makeup or put on a beard. And, and they then got a job working for the company, that, which they're, they're the owner or the CEO or slash president, and they worked alongside the regular rank and file worker. And they were, in essence, an undercover boss. And at the end of the program, you would see the boss take off their disguise, reveal themselves to their co-workers, and then the boss would dole out cash. This is how you do it. They, they doled out cash, big bonuses, to those workers that were exemplary, that cared about their co-workers, that demonstrated value for the business, that modeled what it means to have a regard for what they work, that owned their work. And so they gave out cash to those workers that did that. And you always see these co-workers just weeping because they didn't expect to be, be, to be blessed or to, be, to receive a bonus. 
May I suggest to you that even if you're not on the program, carry yourself like an employer because an undercover boss is watching. There's a big difference between the mindset of one who is an employee versus an employer. This guy goes to the mall. As he's walking in the mall, he looks in this, this window of a store and he sees this beautiful jacket. And he goes inside and he asks the clerk who was an employee, he said to her, he said, ma'am, I, I love that jacket in that window. It just caught my attention. May I see it please in my size? He tells her his size. She gets the jacket and she says it looks rather good and he tries it on. He's staring in the mirror. He's fixing it and she said it looks very good on you. Then he pulls the little tag out of the sleeve and he looks he said, this is a ridiculous price. Look at how high it is. I don't need this thing. Put it back on the rack. And she says yeah you're right it's pretty high. She puts it back on the rack. He walks out the store. An employee, that's her thinking. She's in the corner pouting because she thinks her boss is, I don't like the way he deals with me because I get paid minimum wage and I, does, I work hard. Fast forward now, 15 minutes go by, another man's walking in the mall, he looks in the store, he sees this jacket. And, and he walks in and by this time, that clerk standing over in the corner, pouting, not moving attentively uh, or walking fast to the new customer. So the owner, you know, who still has a name tag, doesn't say owner, but she's carrying herself like clerk as well. And she walks over to the man and says, sir, may I help you? He said, ma'am, I just saw that jacket in the window and I really love the way it looks. May I see it please in my size? He tells her his size and she gets the jacket. He puts it on and she says, that jacket looks really nice on you. And then he pulls the price tag out of the sleeve and he's shocked. He said, look at this thing. It's so expensive. This is unheard of. And she says, you're right. This, he says, I, I don't need this. She said, you're right. No one buys that jacket because they need it. The ones who buy that jacket is because they want it because not only is it beautiful, it makes them feel good about themselves. He then says, do you take American Express? <laughs> See, the difference between someone who is an employee versus an employer is evident in that. And I want you to see that that employee is angry because the, 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 the initial one saying, yeah, I'm not being treated fairly, I should get more money, I should get more pay, but they don't recognize that they're not exuding value, they're not demonstrating care, they're not showing this great regard for the work that they do. And that's what was going on with that third servant that was given the $1.536 million, the one bag of gold. He went and dug a hole in the ground, hid his master's money. So to him, it was his master's money. It was his master's work. He didn't own it as his own. He didn't own the task as his own. He didn't see it that it was an extension of his person. He didn't see that his master was entrusting to him a certain regard. My goal, my heart for you over the series of practical teaching on, on the series title of The Office, my heart is that every one of you would be equipped with skills to make you land a big promotion to make you someone that thrives in your business. Why? Because the church, based on the Bible, teaches skills that's implementable in every walk of life. Jesus goes back to teaching. And verse 19 says, After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I've gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I'll put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man with two bags of gold also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two bags of gold. See, I've gained two more. His master replied, Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. When Jesus spoke it, I can almost imagine as if the curtains closed and opened and we see scene two, work for the Lord. 
To maximize your vocational success, Jesus is helping us don a perspective in regards to how we work. In essence, work for the Lord. No employee is perfect except for God. I get it. You get it. We all get it. But all employers entrust us with a set of responsibilities and expectations. Regardless of your compensation, we're called to model good work ethic. I love how Paul puts it in Colossians 3, verse 23. The apostle says, In all the work you're doing, work the best you can. Work as if you were doing it for the Lord, not for people. So what you see, Jesus is saying, look, if you're going to be a follower of me, if you're going to be a Christ follower, I'm holding you to the highest level of work ethic. I want you now to no longer see yourself as working for Macy's, working for Google, working for the Board of Education, working for the local hospital. I want you to see yourself as someone who works for the Lord. So those servants, the guy with the five bags of gold, you know, the 7.68 million, the guy with the two bags of gold, the three million dollars, when they came back, or I should say when the master returned, the master, the master wanted to see what they've done, performance evaluation. It is amazing. When you start to work for the Lord and how you see yourself, you'll always then expect to have performance evaluation. God's always saying, what'd you do? We Christians, we go around, we like using this phrase. Maybe you've not heard it, but maybe you thought it. It's called compassion overhead. We, we, we then say, well, let's be, you, may, you need to be merciful towards me. We're, show me grace. Be kind. Now, absolutely, we should be merciful, gracious, kind. But that doesn't replace good work ethic. The master didn't say, oh, I knew it was hot. I knew it was a difficult time. I knew the weather was bad. I knew you had a hard way to go. I knew you were involved in entrepreneurial things, which is tough. The master just said, where's my stuff? What'd you do? The guy with the five bags of gold said, master, here's the five bags you gave me. Here's five more. The master said, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful a few things, few things, 7.68 million. I'm going to Put your rule over much. Enter into your master's happiness. The guy with the two bags said, Master, you gave me two bags of gold, three million. Here are two more, another three million. The master said the same thing. You have been faithful with a few things. I'm going to make you rule over much. And enter into your master's happiness. It is amazing. What the master was pointing to is the fact that these guys, the way they worked, it demonstrated that they didn't care about the master's perspective, you know, position, the master's attitude. Many of us, we tend to abdicate our responsibility to work for the Lord by saying, well, you don't know, pastor. I know what you're talking about. It sounds good, but you don't know my boss. My boss is mean. My boss is nasty. And so you're telling me I need to work for the Lord when I deal with my boss? He's mean and nasty. Well, that does not invalidate the scriptures. That does not negate what Paul said in Colossians 3.23. Whether your boss is mean or nasty, he says, when you work, you're not working for people, you're working for the Lord. And you may say, well, you don't know my boss. My boss is short-tempered. My boss is, is, is just quick. He just lets it rip. Sometimes there are expletives. I want you to know that the Apostle Paul did not say that you work for the Lord except when your boss uses expletive. No, the Apostle Paul says, work unto the Lord. And you may say, well, I don't like my boss. Well, it doesn't matter whether you like your boss or not. You may say, you don't know my boss. It doesn't matter if I know your boss or not. You may say, I don't even like you, pastor. It doesn't matter if you don't like me. I just want you to know the scripture is calling us to work when we work as unto the Lord. If we hold to that posture, it changes everything. See, what the scripture is teaching us as Jesus taught and presented this wonderful parable is that he's saying, look, if you want a promotion, if you want to gain more independence, if you want to achieve greater vocational opportunities, Practice good work ethic. Let me give you some of the major aspects of work ethic. By the way, great time to pull out your smartphone and take a picture because you may say, how come I'm not getting in a promotion? How come they pass me over again? And you may say, they're just demonized. And someone else may say, no, they're not demonized. That You just don't have good work ethic. You can't pray away poor work ethic. 
The only way you can pray away poor work ethic is by you practicing good work ethic. One of the signs of a good work ethic is that you're responsible and reliable. What does that mean? You carry yourself so that your employer trusts you. Your word becomes your bond. You exhibit a positive attitude. Optimistic and helpful with other employees, with your co-workers. They enjoy being around you. Another is that you're adaptable and flexible. See, we live in such a fast-paced world. Technology is moving so quick. In fact, you know, studies have shown that even engineering students, by the time the freshman engineering student graduates, you know, three years later, after freshman year, technology has changed. What they learned in year one is now obsolete by year four. So technology is moving so quick. That means we have to be adaptable and flexible when we work. Another work ethic is honest and credible. Your words cannot be slanted, mixed with a spin to get your way, or create suspicion as to your veracity. Your, worth, your words must have some heft of truthfulness to it. That people say, hey, if John said five, it's five. If Mary said five, it's five. Now, there's some people that when they tell me five, I don't believe them. You may say, well, do you work in the church? Don't matter. See, good work ethic is also being self-motivated. When you're self-motivated, successful people reek with self-motivation. Why? They don't need a lot of hand-holding. They don't need babysitting. They don't need micromanaging. They practice self-leadership and they're self-motivated. I love being around those kinds of people. That's what the guy with the five bags of gold practiced. That's what the guy with the two bags of gold practiced. They were so motivated, they went right away, Scripture says, and began to invest the money, work the money, increase their master's net worth. I want you to see there's a great value to having good work ethic. And some people say, if they paid me more, <laughs> man, my work ethic was sore. And I say, not true. Not true. Per work ethic is not, good work ethic is not tied to money. It's tied to personal values. And I don't know if you ever heard of Jamarcus Russell. In 2007, he was the number one draft pick in the NFL. They pulled him right out of college. Didn't even finish up. Pull him right out of college. Number one draft pick by the Oakland Raiders. And they gave him an offer. $61 million. $32 million guaranteed. That's 2007. In 2010, they told him, have a nice day. We part. And they parted on two reasons. Reason number one, his weight and conditioning was not where it needed to be. Reason number two, the most significant reason, was poor work ethic. And to demonstrate his poor work ethic, you know what they did? Just to, just, to, just to make it so real. When you're in the NFL, they'll give you plays, the tape of a play, so you can re rehearse it, memorize it, watch it, view it, know what to do. They gave him blank tapes and said, Jamarcus, here are the, tape, here are the plays. The next day, they said, Jamarcus, are you, are you, do you know the plays? He said, oh yeah, those tapes, man, they're so, they're so informative. They were blanks. Nothing was on there. The guy's work ethic was so shoddy that he blew $32 million that he's up at, I mean, come on. Who would throw away money? And so when you say, if they paid me more money, my work ethic was soar, S-O-A-R. And I'll say, no, it won't soar high. It will soar low because money doesn't affect your work ethic. Personal values do. You got to want this thing. You got to exhibit this thing. And, and don't say, well, I'm a Christian. Even the more reason. I love what Martin Luther, the great scholar, said. Because he had to deal with the same issue in his day. He said, the Christian shoemaker does his duty not by putting little crosses on the shoes, but by making good shoes. Because God is interested in good craftsmanship. So we think that, well, you put a little cross on it. You go to work thinking it's good work ethic because you put a big family Bible on your desk. That doesn't mean you have good work ethic. You're coming late every day. That's not good work ethic. Or you're wearing a big Dracula cross, scaring away vampires. And you're the, you, you just, it doesn't mean that you have good work ethic. I'm not against the icon of the cross. I'm being a little bit silly. But the idea that I'm bringing out is the fact that we must realize good work ethic is not about iconic symbols or even having the biblical reference on the desk or even having Christian or biblical chatter and language 
Good work ethic is when you are walking around in school, not with a D plus, talking, telling people how to share your faith with a D plus. Come on, show me an A, show me a B, then talk about how good God is. Don't tell me God's good. He gave me a D plus. I got a D plus. Praise the Lord. You need Jesus. That does, that's not a good witnessing tool. It doesn't witness much unless you said, man, I was going for an F. I mean, I, <laughs> and I, I thought I was going to tank out and get an F, but I uh, praise God he gave me a D. And you can tell people God's mercy is real. Then if you come from that angle, it's plausible. But come on, come on, come on. Let's show that we're working unto the Lord. Don't you agree? Let's work unto the Lord. Come on. Jesus continues his story. In verse 24, then the man who had received one bag of gold came. Master, he said, I knew that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid and went out and hid your gold in the ground. See, here's what belongs to you. His master replied, you wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. Well then, you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would have, not, I would have received it back with interest. So take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has ten bags. For whoever has will be given more and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. And throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Curtain closes. Curtain opens. Scene three, focus on being productive. It is amazing. Jesus, he's not spiritualizing the story. He's not trying to eliminate the value and the regard of work. See, productive people, they take their role and their responsibilities quite seriously. They own it. The third servant was stalled in the act of what to do at 1.53 million. In fact, the master said to him, you're lazy. And that word lazy in the original Greek in which the New Testament was written, it means you're useless. He did not value the responsibility or the sum of money that was entrusted to his care. The $1.5 million, he didn't value it. And the interesting thing is that what we see from this verse is that unproductive people tend to blame others or circumstances for their failure to thrive. He says, Master, I knew that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown. And gathering where you have not scattered seed. In other words, the servant was saying to his master, from my observation, you've been exploitive with people. You gain money where you shouldn't even gain money. You gather resources where you shouldn't even gather. And so he's blaming the master. See, we ought not to blame anyone for lack of productivity. Productivity is about getting things done. Productivity is about fulfilling your your assignment. Productivity is about fulfilling the role to which you're brought on staff. And somebody, when they are brought on their company or hired by that particular firm, when they hire you, they don't hire you to go out and talk to everybody. Talking to everybody, a social butterfly, talking to everybody. They hire you to get a job done. They don't hire you to witness either. Well, I'm doing the work of the gospel. That's not what they hired you. You have to learn how to do that in ways that don't take away from the primary role in which you're brought on to do. And when you do that, it is amazing as to what results. The unproductive servant blamed the master for his fear. And I understand fear is very debilitating. Fear, it stifles creativity and it somehow, it, it, it makes you numb to logical steps. It, it, it causes you to, to blur your vision of reality. I get it. But at the end of the day, you cannot blame anyone for your fear. And you cannot blame anyone for your unproductivity, your unproductive life, lack of productivity, or even low productivity. I decided as I'm studying about American work ethics and work life, I said, let me check out the Bureau of Labor Statistics to see what the average American works, how many hours a day. 
And the, the Bureau of Labor Statistics says the average American works 8.8 .8 hours every day. Then they drilled a little bit deeper by looking at 2,000 full-time office workers, and they discovered that the, of the 2,000 office workers, the average amount of hours worked per day, though they had 8.8 8 .8 hours with, at the office, they only worked three hours of the 8.8, .8, three hours. I drilled a little bit deeper saying, what's the top 10 reasons why they're so unproductive? The average person on a work day, they spend one hour and five minutes reading news websites. They spend 44 minutes checking out their social media. They spend 40 minutes each day discussing non-related things with co-workers. They spend, on average, 26 minutes a day on their job checking out new jobs, searching for new jobs. They spend 23 minutes taking smoke breaks. They spend 18 minutes every day at work making calls to their partners or friends. They spend 17 minutes each day at work making hot drinks, coffee, tea. They spend 14 minutes each day at work texting or sending instant messages or messaging. They spend 8 minutes on average each day at work eating snacks. And they spend 7 minutes each day making food in the office. It is amazing when you tally up those are the 10 top reasons for low or unproductive people. When you tally them up, they total 4 hours and 15 minutes each day doing those things. God help us. What would happen if you focused on being productive? Oh, you would change. People would love to hire Christians. They would want you more than anybody else. Because they said something about those Christians. I may not like what they believe. I may not believe the same thing. But oh, they're productive when they work. See, people are interested in the bottom line, employers. They don't care if you're black, if you're white, if you're Asian, if you are Latino, if you're a female, male, tall, short, fat, skinny. All they care about is that you make them money at work. And if you make them money, they'll overlook the difference of faith, the difference of race, the difference of gender, the difference of whatever, because you bring home the bacon for them. And they'll say that they'll, they like you and they want you there. Why? Because you help them meet their desires economically, financially, missionally as an organization. And they'll do everything to get you there. What we must do is learn how to solve the problems in our midst so we can be more productive. I love what Albert Einstein said. It's not that I'm so smart. It's just that I stay with problems longer. See, the ineffective servant, this guy lacked humility and honesty. Because if he was just basically humble, he would go to the other two servants that had such stellar results. He would go, to, go with the guy who was given five bags of gold, 7.68 million. Go to the guy who was given two bags of gold, three million, and say, guys, tell me, just, just help me. What do I do? I, I, I'm stuck. Uh, I feel fear. But that was not the case. He lacked good work ethic. Dug a hole in the ground, hid the master's money. What does he do with the rest of his time? What in the world was he doing? He was idle. He was enjoying life. Permanent vacation. And blame it on his master. See, work ethic that's good, it goes a long way. I love what Michael Jordan said about good work ethic. He says, sometimes things may not go your way, but the effort should be there every single night. Every single night. The master said of this servant, because the servant said, when he said to everybody, okay, what'd you do, what'd you do? The servant said, Master, I knew you were a hard man, reaping where you didn't sow, gathering where you didn't scatter any seeds. I was afraid. I dug a hole, I put your, hole, your money in the, in, the, in the hole. Here's your bag of gold. 1.536 million. Here's your bag of gold. I knew you were hard, he said to the master, blaming his master. The master shot back. You wicked and lazy servant. So you call me hard? I call you wicked. 
Now, that doesn't mean morally wicked in there in the Greek language. That word wicked means you unproductive, you wasteful servant. What was he saying? He said, he said, at least you could have taken my money, if you were afraid, and put it in the bank. And it would have gained interest. So on my return, I would have gotten my money back with interest. Now, I did some digging. The interest rate in first century was 12% in banks. So if I took the 1.53 million and I ascribed, since the Bible is silent to how long the master went away, I ascribed just one year. The servant, just by basically saying to the banks, look, my master is tough. I'm scared. I'm just gonna, you guys just keep it. 12% interest on 1.5 million will yield $180,000 in one year. He could have then said to the master here, I'm dropping off to you $1,680,000. Just on that. But instead, he didn't do anything. Now, if I use the average annual inflation rate, it's 3.22%. If I say the master went away for a year, that means that $1.5 million losing 3.2% by putting it in the ground, that means the master lost $49,459 just by that servant burying the money. So when he came back, he said, here's your bag of gold. It didn't have the same value as the 1.536 million. It now has the value of 1.486 million. He lost money just by that foolish, unproductive servant. May I say to you, let's not be like that third servant. Let's not create an unproductive life because unproductive employees, they create low profitability. Unproductive employees create downsizing and employee turnover. Unproductive employees reduce employee morale. Unproductive employees create work avoidance and low benchmarks. Let's turn things around. Let's, when we walk into the office as a Christ follower, let's exude the fact that one, not only we're coming to the workplace, God is coming with us to the workplace. And we're going to be the most productive. We're going to be most, have the most exemplary work ethic. We're going to work like we own the place. We're going to work like an employer. I want us to be able to model these kinds of traits. Imagine when you go to work this week, if your attitude takes that shift, if your demeanor takes that shift, if your perspective takes that shift, you would see yourself poised in position to be able to get promotion, to get advancement. And if that company doesn't advance you, your good name will have such a far-reaching reputation. Others would want you in their company. Others would want you a part of their business. Why? Because when you are someone that have good character and good work ethic, your good name, it makes room for you. A man's gifts brings them before kings. Scripture tells us that. Come on, let's magnify our God. He's worthy of our praise. May this series be one of the most significant in your life and in your work life. I praise God for what he wants to do. I praise him beforehand. Let's stand together. Thank you so much for joining us for Christ Church Online. We pray that you had a great encounter with the Holy Spirit through what we offer here at our church. So please again, subscribe to our YouTube channel or visit us online at www.ChristChurchUSA.org to find out more information on what's going on in our church. Hope to see you next week.